All right. Hello? Right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, and welcome. Um, my name is Soren. Uh, I'm from Denmark. It's my very first year at Python. I really enjoyed it. <coughs> and I hope you have too. And welcome to the start. Um, so, um, I have many different hats. As you can see from my Twitter ID, I'm uh, an Ubuntu developer. I'm also an independent contractor. Uh, but I spend all my time working for Rackspace on OpenStack, and I really like this conference. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the automated stuff we have in our OpenStack compute, uh, also known as Nova. Uh, so both the testing and some of the release process we have that, um, sort of, and all the automation we built into that to try to you know, not screw it up, uh, which is a, a bit of a challenge sometimes. This is a crazy project. All right, um, so OpenStack. Uh, how many have you heard of it before? OK, most people. Great. So have any of you actually used it for anything? Haha, that's it. Anyway, that's good to know. Um, so OpenStack, the OpenStack mission, um, for those of you who didn't attend uh, Terry's talk yesterday, I'm just going to real quick introduce what it is. Um, uh, this is basically it. The mission is to create some cloud computing software that is really cool and works really well and really scalable and, you know, and everyone's supposed to use it. It's going to be great. And there are, uh, from the beginning, there were like two major components. One was called Swift, which is the thing that runs uh, Rackspace Cloud files. Uh, so it's a massive you know, uh, uh, object store, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today at all. Uh, and the other thing is Nova, which is a project that started at NASA uh, to replace the cloud computing platform that we used before because it didn't really work out very well for them. So they wrote a new uh, cloud computing platform in Python. They called it Nova, and this is and we and we took the thing from Rackspace, the, the cloud files thing, and put it together with Nova, and then we called it OpenStack. So that's OpenStack. Um, so OpenStack is a free software project. Uh, and one of the things that that entails is that we have absolutely no control over what people are going to work on. People who want to contribute to the project, they, you know, we, they're volunteers, essentially. Uh, well, from the point of view of OpenStack, volunteers. I mean, most of them are actually developers working for a company that have an interest in OpenStack. But from the point of view of OpenStack, they're just, you know, semi-random contributors. So we can't tell them, you need to work on this stuff. Uh, cloud computing is uh, it's going to be driving a whole lot of different infrastructure, uh, different services and applications that we're going to be using for the next many years. So this needs to be really solid. The quality assurance is absolutely critical. But we can't tell people, all right, stop adding new features. You need to all work on improving test coverage and doing quality control and all this stuff. So, uh, so all we can really do when people want to work on something is say, all right, thank you. Um, we, we can't just tell them, well, we're not going to take a patch, can you write some unit tests instead? Um, so, essentially, we're screwed. Well, no, not in time. So, if we can't actually force people to help us improve the quality of the stuff uh, that we have, at least we can do, at least we can do is to make sure that they don't make it even worse. Uh, and that's not to say that we have a lot of bad contributors, that's not it. I mean, most of the bugs that are in there, I mean, we put them there to begin with. So it's probably all our fault, but we need to make sure that it doesn't get any worse. Um, and for a project that has probably, I don't know, a thousand commits over the last month, I mean, this is, it's impossible to try to keep up. Even if we had like, a big team of people wanting to add uh, unit tests for everything, it's just it's almost impossible to try to keep up with the, 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 the pace of change. Um, so what we, what we did instead, is we try to make all the, the things that we can actually do, all the tests that we actually have, and try to make them more like as relevant as we possibly could. So instead of uh, having the slow tests be something that you know, someone would run that they were really bored and, you know, every two weeks, uh, I mean, we would run them all the time so that we actually use the test that we have. Um, so we also added some, some human processes as well. Uh, so that we could you know, try to uh, maintain some level of control uh, and you know, not you know, lose our minds completely. 
So these processes and, and, and tools is that, I mean, they, they go a little something like this. Um, so say you want to, to get a patch into, into Nova. Uh, the first thing you do is that you grab the code of the launch pad, um, then you write some code, and you push it back to the launch pad, uh, then you click the propose emerging button. What happens is that all these guys uh, get an email saying that, oh, there's someone who wants to get some into the code. Uh, every day, two of these guys are on review duty. Um, so, at least in theory, it shouldn't take very long before someone picks up uh, your patch and reviews it, and gives you feedback, and, and so on and so on. Uh, as I said, this is a crazy project. Uh, on when, when things are, uh, are really moving fast, we might get uh, uh, 150 merge proposals in a month. I mean, it's, it, it's really hard to keep up. And sometimes it, this, this list, uh, this backlog of patches would get really long. Uh, so one of the first things that we uh, talk just really quickly present is this thing, which is uh, the reviews list, which builds a prioritized uh, uh, list of the patches that have been proposed for merging into Nova. Something I'm telling you, wrote. It's, it's really, really great. So what it does is it looks at all the stuff that's been proposed for merging into, into Nova, and then it looks at uh, the, the, the way the launch pad works is that we have a merge proposal, it can either be linked to a bug, or it can be linked to a blueprint, or it can be you know, not linked to anything at all. If it's linked to a bug that's considered, considered critical, then it goes to you know, probably to the top, or very near to the top. Uh, if it's linked to a blueprint that is considered essential for this release cycle that we're in, it also goes very near the top. So this makes it really easy for people on review duty to figure out you know, what other patches I should be looking at today. Uh, and and that's, that's really, really been helpful. Um, so it also kind of makes stuff, you know, move upwards if it gets too old. Uh, this one that's 100 days old, it probably started down here somewhere, and it's slowly, slowly moved up. This doesn't mean that it hasn't been touched in 100 days, it's just that the first, uh, he first proposed it 100 days ago, and then it's probably gone through like a number of different review cycles, so people say, oh, we need to change this, or we need to not do this yet, because of this and that, and we're changing this. Um, yeah, so that's what happens. People, these, these reviewers, they will go through your patch, and they'll give you feedback, telling you what to fix, or, or what is great, and, and then they, they vote on it, saying, well, if I give a not, uh, and if you get not one, but two thumbs up on it, then it gets a seal of approval. And that is, the end of the human involvement in this process. Everything else is automation. So, there was a lot of stuff to do, so we decided to hire a butler. His name is Jenkins, and he's awesome. Um, so what he does when these two core developers have approved the, the patch is that he calls upon a tool called Time, um, which goes through this list and finds the ones that are approved. If it finds something that's approved, which it will because we just approved your patch, um, it downloads the patch. Right, so it takes the patch and tries to apply it to trunk. If that succeeds, it doesn't always because this project moves really fast, so someone might change like, the same lines of code, and occasionally it will fail to apply, and then it will post a comment on on Launchpad saying, uh, this didn't really work out, can you please you know, sort this out? If it works, the first thing it does is to run the test suite. Um, we have a bunch of tests, um, not enough, uh, but we have a, a bunch of them. And most of them are like unit tests like no, no, no. They take uh, a little bit of functionality, they put some, some input into it, and they verify that the output will get out is what we expect. We also have some slightly unorthodox uh, things in our test suite that are not unit tests, but they, you know, perform some checks that we couldn't, uh, that we could do manually, but we also have an option better way to do them, so we might as well do that, because we're really tasty. And one of them is, uh, like for instance this, test all of this up to date. So we have a check that goes through the entire revision control history, finds everyone who's ever committed anything to the code base, and makes sure that they're mentioned in the author's, author's file. 
So we don't have to, you know, at the end of the release cycle, uh, go through all the patches that people have submitted and make sure that everyone's mentioned in the author's file. We check that every single time. So assuming that this, this test is, is written correctly, there's no way that you can get a patch into Nova without getting appropriate credit for it in the author's file. Um, some people think this is really silly, that they have to add themselves to the author's file. That, that just feels wrong to people. But, you know, it's something we can automate, so there's no reason not to. Uh, assuming that this, this works out, uh, sometimes it doesn't, uh, then uh, Tarmac again will, you know, uh, post a comment on Launchpad, uh, giving you the output of the, of the test uh, the test run, and then show you that oh, something failed, please go and fix it. And that looks something like... Uh,
So, if you're going to take just one thing away from this talk, this should be it. Uh, because this has turned out to be really, really, really important. Because uh, it might just seem like it's just a tower block, but really, it's not. This, this much more. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. So what we do is our tarball uh, is different from many other. Uh, the way that we build our tarball is different from many other other projects. And that we up the version number really, really early. In fact, the very first thing we do after we cut a release is to bump the version number. So the version number that you find in our revision control is the one that we're working towards. It's not the one that we just finished. <clears throat> and this has a number of advantages. The most important one, I think, being that the process of cutting a release tarball has been reduced to the simple action of renaming the file. The contents, the structure, the metadata, and so on, all the stuff that's in the, in the file is as it should be at release time. So you don't touch the contents at all, you just rename the file, and you have your release. And this is great. Because there are two rules to follow if you want to make absolutely sure that you screw up your release. The first rule is to make it really manual. The more manual steps, the more sure you are that you're going to screw it up sometime. Especially if you do it really, really rarely. Because if you, you might have documented it really well, written down all the steps you need to do. Six months later, when you're going to do your release again, something will have changed that completely validates your instructions, and then you're screwed again. This needs to be something that you do all the time. Every time someone commits something to Chuck, we build a release tunnel. The process is the same. We go through this all the time. So every time someone commits something to Chuck, we have a chance to see, uh, I mean, the, the, all the stuff that builds our release tunnel is exercised. So we don't spread away if something's wrong. And this is fantastic. Um, so that's the other thing that we need to do if we want to make sure that we screw up your release, is to make it some, some is to make the process of building a release completely different from the thing that you reverse hundreds or maybe even thousands of times between your releases. <coughs> so the thing is, your release is the thing that is supposed to be so golden it's not even funny. People will download your release, and if it sucks, they're going to blame you, and they're going to be really upset, and they should. If people download it on, uh, like a, a release snapshot, and it fails in some way, people are very forgiving because, ah, it's my own fault. I should download and release my snapshot. If you download your release and it doesn't work, you suck. So you need, to, you need to make sure that, you know, this is something that you've done as often as possible. So, and, and, and this, is, this, is, so this is really, really important. The, the first thing you can do is make sure that on the day of your release, you yank the carpet up from under you and just change everything. You change the version number and so on and so on. But it's just a number, it's just, you know, it doesn't matter anything. Oh, okay. That's so wrong. Because this number, having, having this number be the thing that you're working towards, means that you can trust it. It means that you don't have to maintain any, any information about versioning anywhere else. This is the only place we need to change anything to make all the automation that we build around it work. We just increment the version number in, in the version control and everything works. So it's really good if you can look in your mission control or in the table that we built, find the version number, and then you can, for instance, take docs for this particular version and publish it in the place where it's going to live eventually. And when you pop the release number, you just find the release number in in the tarball or in version control, and you can publish it to the right place. What is really bad is that oh, this is not so good. Yeah, no. um, so if this is the time of your release. This is when you. Uh, this is when you actually. actually uh, uh, this is when you make your release. This is when you make your next release. This is all the time in between. So if this is the time when you bump it, that means that the time of it, of uh, the, the the time when you change something, the time when you need to modify you know, where you publish all your, your documentation, when you do all these things, is at is on release date which is supposed to be, ideally, the calmest day of the year because you're not patching anything, you're not writing your code, you're just releasing something. It should be calm. It should not be when you're changing all these different things. So if what you put in your, in your release tarball is the release that you, that you, 
get a dust release and send them on your working source. It means that at on release date, you need to make sure that you bump uh, so you you bump the place where you're publishing your dumps to. Otherwise, the next commit is going to overwrite the documentation for your release. And you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that once you release, it's released and you don't touch it. It needs to, it needs to be trusted that way. So that's the worst thing you can do. Now, making it something that you need to do the next day is, is much better, but ideally, it should be all automated. And that's the way we've done it. So the only place that we maintain this is in the top level. That's great. Um, so, the next thing we do is we have a, a, a delta check. Uh, this is Jenkins, does this as well. So, it goes through the stuff that we have in the tarball, the stuff we have in Visa, and makes sure that if a new file was added to Visa, it also turns up in tarball. So, if someone adds some code that requires a template to be present, if they forget, forget to add it to the manifest, it doesn't get up in, uh, turn up in the tarball. Jenkins will pitch and moan for just, just go on and on and on and on. I see something, oh, there's something up. And someone just needs to go and say, uh, right, that's completely intentional. Just go on with life. Everything's great. So he also checks if something new turned up in the tunnel that wasn't able to speed it up. So this might happen if we suddenly accidentally start shipping a uh, byte compiled code in the tunnel that's not supposed to be there. Um, so we, we have stuff that lives in the tarball, but not in the VZR, and vice versa. For instance, in the tarball, we have a change log, which we build automatically as well. We build it based on metadata in VZR. So that is supposed to be there, so that doesn't turn up on this list. Because that is something that is expected to be found in the tarball, but not in the VZR. Conversely, in VZR, we have a plugin for VZR to build a change log. But there's no point in putting that in the tarball, because if you have the tarball, then you don't have all the visa data you need to build the change log. So we don't put that in the tarball. So we have, I mean, all, we have four categories of stuff, like stuff that is not in the tarball, but isn't visa data. We have stuff that isn't visa data and the tarball. We have stuff that's in visa data but not in the tarball. Uh, and we have stuff that isn't in any other places. That's a stupid, <laughs> that's a stupid category, but we have all four. So the next thing that happens is that we build Ubuntu packages. We build these from the town hall. We do not build them directly from VZR. This is important uh, as well. So again, release day needs to be as much like any other day as possible. And when a final release finds its way to Debian or Ubuntu, the way that happens is by the, the maintainer taking the town hall, applying packaging, and uploading it. It does not take the final releases from VZR from version 4 uh, and uploads it. So we want to make sure that the process of making a, uh, a, a snapshot package is as identical to the releases as possible to reduce uh, that transparency. Um, so another reason why we do this is to make sure that stuff that is, uh, that, that there isn't a, like a shortcut um, into the, the, the packages and mix it up. Uh, at some point, Back, we used to actually build directly from Visa, so we would take, you know, we'd take a check out of the code, we'd apply the packaging on top, and we would build the packages. And then we had some other code to build the tarball. And this means that you know, all the developers, they're running directly from version control. They, they do this thing, they patch it up, and then they, they run you know, whatever test that they want to run. And everything was great. And then the other thing that people might be running was the Debian packages. So again, this was a template file that someone added. Uh, and some code that, that required it, uh, but it was never added to the manifest. So it wasn't in the tarball, but everyone was running either from VZR or from the, the Debian packages. So no one realized that these were missing the tarball. So the reason I did this to begin with, uh, to begin with was to inject the tarballs into the critical path of the Debian package building so that we would notice this as soon as possible, that you know something was missing, we need to fix this. Uh, but you know the other reason is you know, making your release as identical to the whole, the, the, the trunk things uh, is, is really important as well. I'm very long on time. Uh, right. So the next thing we do is we we apply this packaging and then we upload a source package for each of the four uh, current uh, release releases. So Lucid, Maverick, Natty, and Larry. 
This means that we build this package, it gets uploaded, uploaded to a PPA, just a, sort of a, your own private open to thing. Um, it's a, a personal package out there. Uh, and as part of the build, we run the test suite. And this means that for free, we get a test suite run on all these four open versions. And occasionally, we'll see that in one of them it fails because there's, there's something that you know, one of the dependencies is, is, is uh, out of sync with you know, the rest of the world. Uh, and some would say, well, it doesn't matter. You should just you know, install everything using virtual and whatever because then you control the dependencies. Well, yes, if all the dependencies were in Python, they're not. We have specific requirements for you know, LVM, for uh, uh, iSCSI, for the kernel, and all this stuff, and virtual element has to know a lot of that stuff. So we have chosen a reference platform, which is Ubuntu, because we can, uh, because then we have some level of control of the entire stack of things that is in our dependency chain. And this is really, really useful, because we can make open stack as cool as we want, and if some of the dependencies suck in the, in the, in the, in the chain, open stack is going to suck as well. It bleeds into us. So we need to be really on top of this. So that's why we, we work where we work on the current Ubuntu releases, uh, the current development release, because we can still, when we find a bug, we still have, have a chance to fix it. And this, this is great. So, last thing that happens is I have, uh, I have uh, four servers, one for each of these releases, that pulls from this PPA. So whenever there's an update, yeah, uh, uh, these packages install it and run the test suite. Uh, not the same test suite, not the unit test, but integration tests. So we always make sure that we can run, we can run an instance, we can kill an instance, we can uh, create all new views, attach them, detach them, create users, and a few other things. It's not very extensive, but it's really useful that it gets run all the time. Uh, oh, another thing with the PPAs, we don't just use them as part of the quality assurance. We use them for distribution as well. Uh, and I think it's really cool that half an hour after someone approves your patch on Launchpad, you can run the studio and get upgrade, and you have, your, you have new packages with your patch in. And this means that if we discover a bug, uh, the person who wrote the, the patch you know, probably still has it in working memory because it's only been half an hour since we thought about it last. So before we can start testing it, we can start seeing that, oh, in this particular situation, it doesn't work. So we know it really quickly, and we have the full granularity because every single commit stroke results in an upload to this PPM. So we can really nail down that, oh, it worked an hour ago, and it doesn't now, so it must be this commit. And the guy who wrote it, I mean, the last time he thought about it was half an hour ago. So, we have the best opportunities to fix this as soon as possible. Um, another thing that I was hoping that we would have done by now, but I have to cross the top, but we haven't gone to, but we will probably soon, is we're going to make it possible for people to provide resources that they can put in to our objectives. So that if there's a particular configuration of open site that you care about, uh, in the configuration, matrix for open site is crazy. It's like uh, 10 dimensional or something. I mean, you can have choose between seven different hard devices, four different storage backends, three different network models. Uh, it's, it, it's mad. And if you want to do any sort of large scale testing, there's no way that we can cover all these things. So if there's a particular use case, a particular configuration that you care about, you can take a bunch of your machines and and tell our object and setup about them. And we can have a way to update the code on your setup, run the tests, and then you can report back and we know as soon as possible that there's a setup here, there's a configuration here that now doesn't work because someone broke something. Uh, and hopefully we can get that injected into the critical path as well so that the stuff will never even get into trouble if it breaks one of these configurations that someone cares enough about that they volunteer resources to, to, to test it. Um, this hasn't, this is, I, I'm speaking about it in the present tense, but it doesn't really exist yet, but it's something that, that is very much you know, at the end of the top of our to-do list. And it's just, Really complicated as we have around here. Um, I think that concludes you know, the parts of the really interesting things about this. Um, and the short time, so we should probably do questions. Questions?
So the problem now using these are not built this piece is that it builds, it, it is a feature on Launchpad that lets you, so you have your packaging somewhere and then you have uh, a piece of down ramp somewhere and then Launchpad will, whenever that's an update uh, or at most points or anything. Anyway, occasionally it will look at this piece of down branch and then if it's a change, it will upload the packaging and upload it on Launchpad and you don't have to deal with that at all. Right? Right. From the top it's really important because that's the only way that we can really make sure that it has to be identical to the stuff that we end up releasing because we use the same process for that. Having a release uh, in terms of packages is also completely automated and it is essentially the same as cutting a release toggle. It is the process of renaming uh, renaming a file and removing the, the, the bit of the version string that says, I'm a snapshot. And that's it. That is all of the releases to us. So it's so undramatic, it's not even like, um, it is now, because we've automated all this stuff. It was pretty dramatic two weeks ago, but now it's really awesome. It's just really easy. I have nothing better than that. I'm here anyway. Um, given this, like, the stability, I would say the instability of OpenStack in general, do you find problematic to keep the, your PL system like, up to date and, I would say, green or blue as Jenkins is? Um, keeping, uh, keeping the packaging up to date uh, so it doesn't get out of sync with, with what's going on in Trump is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, because people are adding new things and removing things all the time. So I'm, I'm really happy that that is you know, something I have a lot of time for. Uh, I'm not saying it's a full-time job, but I could easily spend five hours a week on just that, just keeping the stuff up to date. Uh, so it's not if it's just for nobody. If I add the other stuff, it's even worse. It's not mandatory for a change to be uh, like a client by a back of change? No. The question was, is it required for a change to be you know, covered by a packaging change as well? No, it's not. Uh, yes, uh, because all this stuff is not it's not in the critical path of merging a patch, uh, but eventually it probably will be. Uh, but right now it, it, it's not. Um, so there's a bunch of these things that, I mean, only the unit tests and the PIMAG check uh, are fatal for merging. Everything else is just to make sure that we know about problems really quickly. Uh, but hopefully we can make as much of it part of you know, the, the release uh, of, of the patch acceptance because there's not really any good reason not to. I mean, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no excuse for, 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 for breaking things if, if we can actually you know, avoid it automatically.